Hello, I'm Peter Libby from Boston's Brigham and Women's Hospital and the Harvard Medical School. We're very interested in cardiovascular prevention and we're surrounded by a cacophony of risk markers, calcium scores, cholesterols of different flavors, cardiovascular risk biomarkers. How do we make sense of all of these different markers and more importantly, what can we do to alter them in a way that will benefit our patients? I'm joined here today by some of my colleagues to discuss one of these risk markers which is not captured in some of our traditional algorithms, and that is abdominal adiposity. Gentlemen, maybe you could introduce yourself to our audience. So I'm uh, Jean-Pierre Depré, the Scientific Director of the International Chain on Cardiometabolic Risk. I'm Robert Ross, and I'm uh, from uh, Queen's University in Canada. I'm a member of the advisory board of the chair. And I'm Luc Van Gaal. I'm an endocrinologist and dermatologist from uh, Antwerp University in Belgium and also part of the uh, chair committee. So Jean-Pierre, maybe you could share with us some recent data about how we can refine risk prediction with new measurements of abdominal adiposity and how we can use that in practice to address our patients' risk and improve their outcomes. Yes, indeed, Peter. Some exciting uh, data now are in the public domain because they have been reported at, uh, at scientific meetings. And among those studies, there's this very large imaging uh, study for which I was the principal investigator, the Inspire Me IAA study, which is simply a study where more than 4,000 patients seen in 29 countries around the world uh, were imaged for the amount of abdominal visceral fat, for the amount of liver fat, and an extensive cardiometabolic risk profile was uh, determined on these uh, patients. And in this study, we had about one-fourth of those patients who had normal glucose tolerance, another thousand patients that had impaired fasting glucose or impaired glucose tolerance, and almost 2,000 uh, patients who had type 2 diabetes, either well-controlled type 2 diabetes, about 50% of them, and another 50% with poorly, poorly controlled uh, diabetes. And a very interesting finding was that uh, across those glucose tolerance group, from normal to poorly controlled type 2 diabetes, there was this very, uh, 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 very robust gradient in terms of visceral fat accumulation. So the, the poorer was your glycemic control, uh, uh, the greater was your amount of, of visceral fat. And accordingly, the greater was also the amount of liver fat measured by, by computer tomography. And actually, we found a very uh, highly significant correlation between visceral fat accumulation and liver fat accumulation. And when we look globally at this large group of, of patients, actually, visceral fat accumulation and liver fat accumulation explain a fairly large proportion of differences in the cardiometabolic risk profile of those patients. And finally, because this was a, an international study, we had more than 1,000 of those patients coming from Asia, from, from Japan, uh, from China. And uh, we found that Asians were more prone at much lower BMI value. They were more prone to visceral fat accumulation. And as a consequence, they were more prone to liver fat accumulation. And this is a very interesting finding suggesting we have now one, one possible explanation as to why Asians cannot afford to gain weight because they are more prone to putting on in their abdominal cavity. As a consequence, they put on liver fat and they develop uh, metabolic complications. So in a nutshell, those are the, the key findings of uh, this large imaging study. So Bob, let me ask you, how can we apply this new information in managing patients and reducing their risk? Well, I think, Peter, as Dr. Dupre uh, just suggested, we can't uh, overstate the importance of the size and diversity of this sample upon which we have a standardized methodology to look at abdominal obesity and uh, ectopic fat, as we say, deposition of fat in the liver across the various races. You know, right now, despite our understanding of the importance of the accumulation of visceral adiposity, we know very little 
with respect to how race and gender affects that relationship. And I think Inspire Me provides us such an opportunity to, as Dr. Dupre says, to be able to characterize uh, our Asian uh, population in a way that truly identifies the amount of visceral adiposity and indeed ab abdominal subcutaneous fat in relation to cardiometabolic uh, risk profile. I'm looking forward with excitement to the opportunity to mine this data set and to be able to help our clinical colleagues down the road understand the different phenotypes and just how visceral fat affects the cardiometabolic risk pro uh, profile is exciting times ahead. And Luke, uh, can you put this into a broader context in terms of prevention and in particular with your interest in diabetes and pre-diabetes, how can we integrate these data into the broad picture? I think this uh, study, Peter, and these new uh, results are confirming previous work in smaller groups of patients that has indicated that intra-abdominal fat is not only a risk factor for type 2 diabetes, but once you became a diabetic patient, that risk for cardiovascular complications will progressively increase. After the initial concept of the Apple and Peer story in the early 80s became clear, I started to measure the waist circumference in every single diabetic patient that I've seen in my practice. And so we have accumulated a lot of data and we were able to show that the larger the waist circumference is, the higher the risk is in that population of developing hypertension, cardiovascular disease, myocardial infarction, and so on. So I think it is now not only reassuring, but surprising good that with a absolute correct measurement of intra-abdominal fat by CT scan, that these data are confirmed. And it also confirms a previous study where we, many of us have been uh, uh, implicated in, which was a study that showed also all over the world using the waist circumference, that even in lower categories of BMI, you see a huge risk for type 2 diabetes once the waist goes up. What I always say to my students is, if you have a BMI of 40 or higher, the excess of fatness all over the body is so huge that you have to treat that patient, of course, appropriately. But let's not forget the patients with a limited degree of overall fatness, because in that specific patient, the place where the fat is located is becoming so crucial in the visual compartment and now, as was uh, clearly stated by Jean-Pierre, also in the liver. So these are two crucial aspects that I think become extremely important for further treatment of our patients with type 2 diabetes. Now, you know, in daily practice, <clears throat> we know that lifestyle is a major intervention that can try to address this aspect of cardiometabolic risk, but lifestyle is very difficult for the practitioner, the busy practitioner, to implement. And so, the reaction is, well, maybe I can lower cardiometabolic risk with a prescription and give everyone a statin who seems to be at risk and that should take care of the problem. Jean-Pierre, do statins alter this aspect of cardiometabolic risk? Well, the interesting thing of, uh, uh, in Inspire Me IA is that we had that data also on uh, statin users and non-users. And we found that appropriately so, actually, the higher was the perceived risk by, by physicians. For instance, patients with type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease in our cohort had the lowest LDL cholesterol levels because they were aggressively uh, treated with, uh, with the statins. So clearly, the physician recognized this is a high risk patient. I need to manage the risk uh, uh, with, uh, by the use of a statin, unfortunately. Unfortunately, in those patients with type 2 diabetes, the more visceral fat they have, irrespective of whether or not they were on statin, the more disturbed was, were the remaining features of cardiometabolic risk. So the LDL cholesterol-driven risk appeared to be properly managed by uh, statin therapy, but we should not forget, and this is what the study is providing in terms of additional information, that is a a fairly large proportion of, of the, the remaining risk, which is not managed currently by physicians. 
So the problem of abdominal adiposity can't really be fully managed with a prescription pad today, and we all have to work together and with our primary care colleagues in trying to enforce and motivate uh, behavioral changes and adopting a healthy lifestyle in order to really make inroads against this burden of risk. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for joining me this afternoon.